You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Moritz Sieben and I, Niels Kastoblas, are back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series, which is our weekly ongoing raw exploration of the world of rules-based investing. And of course, where we also take some of your questions. Although today we are changing the format a little bit um, because we are delighted to be joined, or I should say rejoined by a very special guest, namely Mark Resepsinski, who many of you will know from his previous appearance on the podcast, as well as his popular blog. So let me start by saying welcome back to the show, Mark. It's great to see you. Thanks a lot for having me. I, I always enjoy coming on here and having a wide-ranging discussion because so, sometimes we just don't know where this might take us. That is true. I think today will be one of them, but uh, also let me say hi to you, Mark. So good evening, actually, today. Good evening, Niels. How are you? And hello, Mark. Absolutely. So, uh, of course, in order to spend as much time with you, Mark, on some of the topics that you uh, thought were interesting to dis discuss, Morris and I will do a much shorter roundup of this week's action in, in the markets and in our portfolios. And since we are recording on a Friday evening, European time, a few hours before the markets are closing, uh, if something big happens in the next few hours, at least you know why we're not mentioning it, because we're doing it a little bit early. And it actually, in fact, in terms of a, a kind of a market summary, which which I normally do, I have to say, this is something I normally do on a Saturday morning with a cup of coffee. And since we are a day earlier, I didn't really find that much to uh, put into this summary this week. Although I will say the last few days, for anyone who's lived, who lives in Europe, for sure, what's really dominating uh, the news headlines is Brexit, because it is coming to yet another self-imposed deadline, which um, they have, of course, missed all the previous many deadlines in the last four years. But at least we know that the 31st of December is, um, at least I think it is, a hard deadline when it comes to a close. Now, before I turn over to you, Moritz, to say a little bit about what happened uh, in your week, let me just mention to you, Mark, that your microphone is making some noises when you move around, so just be wary of that. Okay. Um, so we, we are picking up a lot of these things. So, Moritz, I have a feeling you've got good news for us this week. That's because you saw me with a glass of champagne in my hand. Um, that is true. <laughs> dancing around my desk here. No, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I have said this last week, you know, with a little bit of luck, my trend following system would turn positive for the year. And ipso facto, it did just today. Having a great week, uh, making a lot of money on the emissions contract, European carbon emissions, that is. Um, I'm along that contract since since quite a while. And today the bonds are performing in the way that I'd like them to perform on the on the on the long side. So just a black zero, but as you have alluded to. It's two hours to go before the weekend, which means the day is still very, very young. <laughs> the month is still very, very young. With a little bit of luck, bad luck, uh, I'll be down 10% by New Year's Eve. So who knows? But uh, today feels good. Well, then at least the champagne will be for something different than uh, celebrating performance. So uh, exactly. Yeah. No, as, as you rightly say, there's a, still a few hours uh, left. But on our side, same picture, though. We don't trade emissions, so I'm sure we're not... Being it, we're not able to keep up completely with you this week, Moritz, but it is a good week for trend-following strategies also on our side, as well as actually our volatility strategy. And on our side really has been so far bonds and currencies that have been the leaders this week. Let's leave it at that. Let's do something that is much more important, and that is to talk about some of the topics that uh, Mark thought would be interesting to discuss and for you the audience uh, just so you're aware Morris and I are not exactly aware of what the content will be we know a little bit about kind of the topic headlines I think this will be quite a fun conversation where we are the ones uh, not really knowing what's coming so uh, almost over to you here Mark I mean trend following did not meet expectations and I think I know what you mean by that teaser when you send it over because well, I think I know what you mean. At least from my point of view, I can understand why people look at 2020 and think, wow, that's a great year for something that 
profits from change, but because boy, have we had changed all year long. Is that the kind of direction you were going and, and people are surprised that it didn't quite work out that way? I think so. And uh, the way I would par- paraphrase this is that what if I had a financial crisis and trend followers did not show up? And especially when we think about all of the work that uh, and the narrative about trend following is that if there is a crisis, trend followers will make money. And in this particular case, if you look at 2020, we've had the greatest crisis in a decade. And for a lot of trend followers, it seems as though they've missed this opportunity. Now, I will sort of say that there's been a tremendous amount of dispersion in managers. So if you look at the indices overall, you know, whether it's uh, from SockGen, from uh, Bridges, other groups, is that the numbers are slightly positive. They've been uh, hovering plus or minus two percent or uh, around zero, but there have been some very great performance by some managers, some that haven't performed well for a while. And uh, there are others where you're scratching your head. How come they didn't make money? So, so I guess is that the theme I would sort of say for the, this year is, is, is that we had a crisis and uh, nothing showed up or the trend followers didn't show up to, to do what they were supposed to do. Now, Fortunately, is is that for those who have had uh, equity in their portfolio, they've done well if they just held on. But for what we was expected, you should make sure that uh, if you sort of expected a trend followers would do, do well, this would it was a year for disappointment. So now the question comes in: Is why is that? Why why did that happen? And uh, I think that that's been an area where I've been trying to spend some time on research. Because just for, for clients I work with and for my personal benefit, I want to try to understand this year and try to understand what trend followers could have done better or what could have been done differently that would have improved performance. And the first thing that sort of comes out is, 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 that, is that there's been a big disconnect between the financial and the real economy. So that while we've had a tremendous impact on the real economy because of COVID-19, the financials have not really looked like they've been affected. So in that sense, the financial crisis did not occur for trend followers if you just look at financial assets. Now, in particular, you sort of say, I always have what I call the Rip Van Winkle effect. Assume that you went to sleep on January 1st of 2020, and lo and behold, right before Christmas, you decided to wake up and you just looked and someone showed you the paper, what would you think of this year? You'd say, it's a pretty good year. Stocks did well. And I wouldn't expect that trend followers would have done that well, you know, given the, the, the diversification they do and what they try to do. And yet that masks all of that, what was going on during the year. The other thought experiment I like to do is sort of say, well, let me tell you what happened to the real economy, or let me tell you what happened in the news tell me what you think would have happened to markets. And if I told you we were going to have a massive shutdown around the globe, we had a financial crisis in uh, March of liquidity, what do you think trend followers would do? You would have come up with an exact different answer. And you would have said, I would have expected this would have been a great year for trend followers. So why was this the case? Now, in some senses that I like to sort of say that first there was a fast response by governments. And when the governments respond with policy very quickly, then what you'll have a situation is that you don't have the divergence that you would like to see in trends that would create profit opportunities for trend followers. So we had a bad March. April, we were already back in uh, and moving in the opposite direction. Similarly, is is that what we've really seen is is that there's been a tremendous amount of uh, control of prices by governments. Some would call this financial repression, but because they've smoothed out the prices in financial assets, whether it be in credit markets, equity markets to by just providing monetary liquidity and bond markets, is that that has not allowed trends to develop as you would expect in a crisis. If we look at those markets where there is not financial repression, there has actually been some very strong trends. For example, we had a very strong trend in gold. We had, uh, if you look at uh, Bitcoin, uh, they've had tremendous moves. 
If you look at the ag markets, we've had some strong movements in ag markets. We've had strong moves in some of the industrial metals because of the strong growth in in China. And uh, we've seen that we've also had uh, some strong moves in, in currencies. But those areas where we've seen the government has had direct intervention or that they've tried to, quote unquote, manipulate markets or they control prices, that those have not been as effective for trend followers. Now, there have been some good you know, macro traders who have done well during this, but not to the trend followers. Yeah, I mean, that that's a, definitely a, a mouthful for us to uh, discuss because I think you you touch on some really important points and I actually think this is a big topic in the kind of the year-end reviews that uh, people are going to go through now and, 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 and looking into 2021 on the various investments they've made. Before, uh, we can go to you, Moritz, and you can comment on, on what Mark uh, said. I'd love to hear that. But I think, Mark, just to sorry to go on about this noise that I can hear, I think it's some paper maybe on, on your desk or something like that. It seems like when or something is making a noise on your side, if you just would be aware of that. Okay. Moritz, Mark is touching on a couple of interesting points. I have some opinions to throw in, but I want to hear your views on why... 2020 may not be the year people would expect it to be when they look at our industry? Yeah, great start to that podcast. I never thought about it that way, Mark, but when you mentioned that the non-financial assets had strong trends, the agricultural markets, the base metals, the energies, right? Throw Bitcoin in there, throw gold in there. I think that's all true. And really the financial assets this year got probably manipulated to a point where it was too difficult for us to really take the right positions right, quote unquote, right? Or the moves were too quick, the correction was um, too brief and it snapped back the other way and we were just wrong footed on that. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, using your analogy of you know waking up just before Christmas Eve, of course, everybody can look back onto the markets and explain what happened in 2020. You know, some of those reviews will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Some of them, I think, are probably as always Worthwhile reading and other ones is just a repetition of stuff that you know already. What I get a little bit more irritated by every year is the forecasting for 2021. And maybe we can go down that mm-hmm. route and at, at some point, and I know Niels has some other opinions on that, but it will happen. It's like clockwork. In the next two to three weeks, I think it has already started. I've already started reading the first couple of ones. I saw right. them, right? <laughs> so it's it, it will happen. It'll be like, the vaccine's there, everything's good. Or the vaccine's there, comma, but it's still, everything's terrible because there's like all these secondary order effects that we don't know about. And everything in between. And none of that stuff is really meaningful to us, but it's uh, you know meaningful to the people that produce that content. But for us systematic traders, there's nothing to say. So maybe we can also speak, but, and I, I know that we probably share that same opinion that, you know, this is all clickbait, but what about the narrative for next year? What do you th- see about you know trend following, or trend followers do in the in, in the next uh, couple of months? Right. Well, well, I think that this is going to be a, actually a much better year. Now, there are a couple reasons why I think this. This is that one is is, is that uh, there is the potential for higher inflation. Now, I think that I I wrote a recent blog that said inflation is coming. Inflation is coming. It's like Paul Revere uh, riding out to the uh, Concord to warn everyone of of coming inflation. It usually will take longer than what we expect. So there's this old comment by Rudy Dornbush, who's an MIT professor, probably everyone in macroeconomics followed it. And he said that in economics, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then happen faster than you thought they could. So that we could easily sort of say that inflation may not be getting up to 2% next year, but there's more and more pressures that we're be building and pressures that build our potential for trends. And this is consistent with themes that I've been talking about for a very long time. What is trend following? Trend following is a divergent trading pattern that you look for market dislocations. And there is the potential for market dislocations because of inflation. There is a potential for market dislocations just because of government policies. And that's going to have an impact on a number of markets that could lead to good trends. And I think that that's what, what we should see in 2021. 
Now, we can't, as good trend followers, we can't predict where the next trend will come from. But we can sort of say that as pressures build, there are going to be greater opportunities for trends. A perfect example would be is that if you look at currency markets, we've written about how low volatility in currency markets have been. Now, surprisingly, even though we're at probably uh, decades lows of volatility, at the same time, you've seen that, that there's been a strong dollar sell-off. It's mostly been in the euro at this point. But you can sort of see that the, the impact of policies in 2020 will start to lead to trends over time that will carry over to 2021. If you have all of this liquidity from the, on the dollar side, well, then you're going to see this slow grind down in the dollar. And now we've seen it at multi-year uh, lows. It's, it's, it's hitting uh, lows. And I think that we're seeing monetary policy play out there in, in the form of trends. Yeah. I want to actually go back to your first topic, if I may, because I still think we need to unpack this year of 2020. And also, it, uh, you know, I think this thing about, you know, crisis and crisis alpha and all, and all of that good stuff. I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about 2020 is, of course, that it wasn't really a financial crisis to begin with, right? It was a health crisis that yes. affected the financial markets uh, in a huge way. It did so in a way that we had not seen before in terms of the speed and the amplitude of the moves and maybe even to some extent to the correlations between some of these markets that we haven't seen for a while. So you could say when something like that happens and we have absolutely no data points that looks like this in the research we do, it's hard to expect, I think, that that systems like what we run should have any high probability of, of making money. It's, it's kind of a little bit random as to how it will do through something that it's never seen before, in my view. And although we have certain things that obviously have led us to design our systems in a certain way, the my takeaway from the year so far is from a ballpark point of view, the people who did well initially, because they were good at reducing risk and getting short maybe, et cetera, et cetera, they were kind of the ones that got caught and then over the summer didn't do so well. And vice versa, the ones that didn't do so well and maybe were a little bit slower, they actually got kind of, you know, quote unquote, saved a bit from what happened and have caught up and are probably a little, you know, you know a bit, little bit ahead in the trend following field. So I think it's been that, from that point of view, I think it's been an unusual year, but I also think it's a really valuable year because it really has given us some data to put in and to analyze and i think that a lot of research departments around the world in this industry will be looking at okay so now we know that markets can move like this how can we find better ways of not necessarily change what we do in the long run but maybe become a little bit more adaptive at certain times so I think in that sense, it is an, an unusual year. And I think you mentioned it as well, Mark. There's been a lot of return dispersion. And even between short-term managers and, and longer-term managers, I mean, short-term managers clearly did better uh, early on. But they've kind of, I think the longer-term managers have done better recently. So the, the difference is not that great anymore. That's another interesting thing, which is actually something that often get confirmed when you go through a crisis Certainly, the ones I've studied, which is eighty seven and and dot um, uh, com and and the two thousand and eight. If you look at different types of managers through those crises, it the pattern was very clear. Short term managers did well initially, but then as the crisis, you know, got longer, right. the longer term managers caught up and actually ended up doing better. This crisis, we don't really know if it's over. I mean, it, it's over if you look at terms of equity markets and, and, and the US in particular all-time highs, but a lot of European equities have not regained their, the levels from January. So from that point of view, it's still in, in some kind of drawdown. Right. And I think that, well, at one level, Niels, I sort of disagree with you. That's good. In a sense, this is that uh, uh, I think that the benefit of trend following is that it's somewhat model agnostic 
in the sense is that since it's looking at price uh, price behavior in the past and then just sort of extrapolating or looking for uh, for opportunities based on trend, it's different than a systematic model where you say, I've looked at a lot of data and said that given these three conditions, I expect that this will happen tomorrow. Trend following just says is that if prices are moving up, I will uh, I will also move up. I will be long, and it uh, other than that, it makes uh, no other assumptions. And so, as long as as markets find seek some direction, there will be an opportunity for a trend follower to profit. But I have to push back again on this one, Mark, because. You can't make that statement without saying, "Well, I'm going to use a 40-day look back or a 300-day look back." And the and and even though you're right in the sense that we know make no predictions, and I completely agree, if market moves up, we go long, etc. It's how soon do we go long, and how you know, and that is what to me because we did a study and we do this on a regular basis, where we take a very generic trend-following model, right. and we look at basically look back periods from 40 days to 300 days and we go back many years to see how different these look back periods would have been on a trend following system right not exactly the one we trade but a generic classical trend following system and what i can say about this year is that there's a huge difference in performance between time frames that are actually relatively close and this is from memory i'm not I, I, you know i'm quoting it from memory but to give an example it could be that had you chosen 120 days you would have lost 20 percent. had you gone for 180 days you would have made 10 percent. and i heard also other people say we don't use moving average crossover systems but i've heard other people quote that when you did, if you were using moving average crossover systems, that even a difference of 10 or 15 days in your settings would have meant a huge difference in performance. So that is what I meant. It's not to say that, yeah, trend following shouldn't be able to handle new environments. Of course it should. But when I talk about it's not in our data set, it, it means that for from all the testing we do, in order to select what timeframes and parameters we want to trade, whether we do it from a discretionary basis, as some managers do, or whether we do it from a systematic, if through a systematic process like we do, it still is based on what took place in history. And if it never took place in history like this, then I think it's a little bit random whether you ended up with the right parameters or not. Oh, well, there's no question is that the only way that you can explain the dispersion in managers for 2020 is the fact that small differences in model amplified into large differences in return. Yeah. So, and, and I will sort of say that this has been an age old problem yeah. because I remember when we were running at, at John Henry, we'd sometimes see a client and they, and we would be in a period where we were in a drawdown or we weren't making money. And some client would show us a chart and said like, you know, look, here's the gold chart. Look, it's, there's a clear trend here. You're telling me you couldn't have made money in the gold market. And then you try to explain is that, well, it's based on our moving average or our, our, our underlying model. It's our risk management parameters. And, and and they'll just look at you quizzically and say, I see on the chart there's a trend. You should have made money. Yeah. Why did you do it? So, but I, I think that there's there's two things that I want to unpack with, with this for 2020. And uh, before we move on, is is that one is, is is that when I always look at a trend follower and think about a trend follower, I always sort of sort of break it down into three factors. And and we may have touched on this a little bit in my last talk. I call it STM. What's the style? What's the timing? And what's the market you choose? So if I need to sort of look at a uh, or describe a trend follower, I, I sort of sort of break it down on those. So if it's markets, how diversified are you? Uh, do you? Are you just trading mostly financials or do you have agriculture? How much energy do you have? So that's the market portion. For uh, timing is, are you a long-term trend follower or are you a short-term trend follower? And what's the mix between those? Because that, that'll have it, have an impact. And then the style will be how you hand it, uh, handle risk. And one of the big issues that we find uh, uh, again and again with trend followers 
today versus 10, uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago is the fact is how do you manage risk in terms of volatility? And so one of the reasons why we sort of had bad performance for 2020 is, is, is that when you think about it, we had low volatility going into mid-February. Okay, so people had uh, levered positions. Then you had some strong market moves, and either you got out quickly or you got hurt, but you had big position sizes given the low volatility. Then volatility sort of you know spiked up to the biggest levels that we saw since you know the uh, great financial crisis. And so your models were telling you that all the position sizes you're going to have take are small. So then you see that we see this big turnaround. You probably started to get long again with some of, let's say, your stock index futures or some bond futures in some cases, or even on certain sort of energy. But given volatility was higher, your position sizes were a lot smaller. And so you may have had a bigger move coming out of the crisis than going in, but your position sizes could have been half the size. So you never made up the money that you thought you did, given the fact that you had to adjust on volatility. And actually what you can do on top of that, because I completely agree, this has been a year of risk management and it's been a year where we have learned a lot about how models react to being fed volatility and correlation data and then you have a massive change in those two inputs so it's been fascinating i think to uh, to see that play out live because you know it's very rare that we actually get or, or our systems get tested to this to this effect so i think that is so true and i would like to bring you in more it's on this one if and and you know tell me if you don't want to answer it that's fine but mark mentions the importance also of the markets you trade you mentioned emissions being a huge contributor this week. I'm wondering, what if you took out emissions and Bitcoin of your performance this year, how different would it be just by, and, and there may be actually other markets, I don't follow some of the markets you trade, but there could have been other markets that are may, maybe not the ones that are in, in, in most people's portfolios that have just made the difference, which of course is what Moritz preach, uh, uh, you know, every week, you should have as many markets as possible because you never know where the trend is. I think this year is definitely a good example of that. But it will be interesting to hear, more. It's how maybe a relative few markets have made a big difference. They have, but in my experience, it's always the case that you have some clear leaders at the end of the year and they stand out. And by the way, it's not Bitcoin. Remember that Bitcoin had a massive breakdown earlier this year. And uh, trend followers got wrong-footed on that one. So we lost a lot of money. I've made back that money and then a bit more, uh, holding a long position in recent weeks and months. But Bitcoin is not my best trend-following performance asset. It's crude oil still. It's still crude okay. from, from March, April, May. Um, yes, emissions, I think, ranks in the top five. Um, and there's a couple of other markets. But as I've said before, for my style of trading, I think it is important to have as many trading opportunities as I can possibly get with my data. I'd like to place as many bets on a roulette table, on a blackjack table. Here it is. I'm showing up with my cards. I'm playing each of these markets in the same way. And the more hands I can play, the more markets I can trade. If I have an edge, the greater the statistical probability for my edge to play out which is why I want these markets included in the portfolio. But this is something I've mentioned before. I want to, and I, I hope I'm not going to provoke the two of you too much with uh, <laughs> what I want to throw at you, but you have both mentioned, or Neil, you have mentioned that, that this year is an unusual year. And I think there's two ways of looking at that. You, you know, we as humans, we're biased because we live in the right here, right now. And right now the COVID crisis is here. We're in the middle of a lockdown tomorrow, probably, or Monday, the latest, the lockdown is going to become more severe in Germany. We're going into a hard lockdown. So everything around us is COVID. Everything around us is a health crisis. You've mentioned it's a health crisis, not a financial crisis. I actually tend to disagree. I think we we are in a financial crisis long before COVID, and now we're in, in an even worse financial crisis. We're definitely in a big, big financial crisis with all the zeros uh, that nobody can no longer count. Massive financial crisis that we're in. But it's all COVID in our heads. And this is why we think this year has been so unusual. And we tend to say, 
we need to make exception. It's it's kind of like this one-off event. Now, imagine you're a Martian and you come to planet Earth uh, for the first time and you don't know that there's a COVID crisis going on. But the first thing that you do as a Martian is you look at all the financial market data history that we have. It's kind of like the Bloomberg Martian, right? The, the first thing he does is he opens the Bloomberg terminal and downloads all the data. And he looks at the statistical properties. He's a researcher, bot, right? A scientist. And this guy doesn't know that there's a COVID crisis going on. And he would look at 2020 and say, perfectly normal. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely within the realm of probabilities. What, what, what has happened? Nothing has happened. We've had a 35% drawdown. This time they've recovered from it a little bit quicker than usual. That's it. Statistically speaking, and I really think that's true, from a scientific research perspective, nothing is spectacular about 2020 at all. It's one of those years. You do not know what Monday's return is going to be. In fact, you would actually need to say that if Monday's return is kind of like, you know, say 20 basis points up or down, that is as unusual a return as a larger magnitude return because crazily, our return distribution is highly leptocurtic and skewed, right? It's not normal. So any return that doesn't fit that normal distribution, you would say, that's kind of weird, right? So we tend to think that these small movements, smooth markets, as everything is trending and organized, is in, is in some way normal, whereas the opposite is true. It is, it is not necessarily normal. We're living in a world that is not normal. So really, when you, when you break it down that way, I don't think 2020 is all that strange. It is, it is, it is just you know, a financial year. And I would be very careful to use that year as either as a researcher that designs trading systems or as somebody that allocates to trend following trading models, I would be very careful to use just that one year to make changes, either in the way that now you say, oh, I need to become short term because now those short term models work. And now we're going to have, we now know that we have these crazy V shaped things and therefore we need to become shorter term. Mm, I wouldn't make that bad. And at the same token, or by the same token, I wouldn't recommend that allocators or investors change their approach to trend following because of what has happened in 2020. If your decision point is 2020, like a one year, you have no business in trend following. This is not your style of trading if you're a one year type of guy. And if you're changing your allocation within a year. So I, I hope I don't provoke you too much with that. But to, to just say that, you know, this is all so special and also only COVID, and therefore we have an excuse. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not in that boat. So I want to hear Mark's view. That's right. going to be much more interesting than my view. But what I will say <laughs> about your Martian looking at the financial markets and saying this is completely normal, he clearly didn't look at all the people walking on on uh, on the ground around him wearing masks because that's not that normal. Yeah, I would say. It, it, and, I know and, this is not normal, but <laughs> this is not finance, right? We 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 don't trade people wearing masks. We trade no, the markets. But remember, markets also reflect human behavior, right? So so uh, there is a little bit of a link between what we humans do and what markets do. But what I will say before I leave it with Mark is to say, you're right. Change is change, and that is normal in the financial markets. What is not normal still, in my view, is the speed it happened with, because that you can go back and look up, and it's never happened with this, um, you know, with this speed. So that's the unusual part. I also agree with you that people shouldn't um, look at 2020 as the most important data point that they've discovered and change all the models accordingly. Completely agree with that. It's just another data point that you need to take into consideration, which we will do anyways when we do our research, because now it is part of the historical data. So it will be interesting. Anyway, Mark, let's hear what you say about those Martians. There is nothing that we saw in 2020 that should cause a researcher to say, I have to fundamentally change my view on how I trade trends. At the same time, you could still agree that the 2020 was, has been an extraordinary year. And this is where I probably differ with some trend followers. So, uh, and, and you know, I'll contrast, for example, John Henry. John, John Henry would sort of say, 
I just look at prices. I don't really need to look at the news. I don't need to know macro context. The markets will tell me all that I need. And so, so that doesn't mean he wasn't news aware, but he said that context is not that important for how I trade. And I would probably have a different view as I'd sort of say, I may not, uh, uh, I, I need to know context because context will help me with asset allocation. Context will help me in how I think about how I should build or, or work on my research agenda. And in that sense, the context that I found for 2020 is unique because the reason why we, it doesn't look like such a surprising year was because the government intervened to such an extent to smooth out prices. This is that assume that the Fed didn't do what they did in March. Assume that the ECB did not take actions that they they took. Assume that fiscal policy did not change radically from what we have, because in some sense, at three trillion dollars, the U.S. fiscal fiscal policy was about fourteen percent of the entire U.S. GDP. In some sense, you have this great. On the left hand, I'm going to lock down all of the businesses, and the right hand, I'm going to pay out a tremendous amount of money for people who can't now work. Now, it's going to cause distribution effects, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking with the left hand and paying out with the right hand. Or the fact that we're having populist views versus progressive views. And then you think about, you just sort of changed interest rates radically over the last 10 years, drove them down to zero, it drove them negative in Europe, have a tremendous impact on pension plans, people's savings rates, and creates vast inequality because those people who are, the, uh, who are uh, in the financial elites were able to benefit from all of this. Well, those people who are in smaller savers or people who had more of their money on fixed income we're devastated. So in some senses is that policies have now sort of set the tone for what we're going to see in the next year. Now, this is not to the point of what about trend following? And in that, I still think is, is that what it tells us for 2020 is, is that those markets where there's greater or heavier government intervention may have fundamentally different trends than those markets that are uh, that have less government intervention and less control or financial repression. And I think that that should have an impact on how you think about maybe adjusting some of your asset exposures for 2021. thing I want to because I, th I think it's what what Marty is saying is it's interesting in one way because of course in, in as trend followers and and not looking at anything in terms of fundamentals and news and all of that stuff you could say that this year in some if, if you were going by what John Henry did just looking at prices and that's all that matters and and so in some ways you could say yeah this is just another year yeah. I agree with that I agree with that now, what makes it uh, more relevant to look at the, you know, say a difficult year? It's always good to look at the difficult years and see what, you know, what uh, what caused it to be difficult. Because I think we have to acknowledge at least that this is what our investors, our clients need. They need a little bit of narrative. They need to kind of understand why the 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 market moves had such a you know had the impact it had on one trend follower compared to another one that is what we need to help them with because they have to stand in front of their investment committee and and kind of defend our strategy uh, from time to time so that's why i do think that it's interesting to 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 do talk about what made the year um, in my view, and are still an unusual year, even though performance it's pretty muted, really plus minus five percent for most of the bigger managers, with a few exceptions. Um, so it's not like it's been a in a, a year where where we've seen a huge move in in returns, except in these more niche strategies like volatility or something like that. Right, Moritz. Any more provoking thoughts? Uh, well, enough of the provoking. I mean, the, I think it's it's interesting to, um, of course, observe and analyze the root cause for differences in trend following performance. You know, I enjoy looking at that. 
how was a short-term trader positioned in March and April and, and May? And how was I positioned in March and April and May? And, and how much difference was there? This, okay, you can then present to an investor and explain why, for instance, you have done better or you have done worse than peers. Okay, fine. But it is not in any shape or form, in my opinion, relevant to what happens next. I will not say that 2020 is more relevant because of what happened than any of the years prior. To me, the data is the data. It's all relevant. I'm not going to emphasize and change my trading system to be more responsive to a 2020 lookalike year in the future. I cannot do that. And some of the things, yes, I agree with, you know, what Mark is saying, you know, we, we're, we're not here closing our eyes to the outside world. And the only thing we do is look at price data. Of course, we are context aware. We're aware of what happens out there in the world. But really, when you think about it, you know, when you look at history, none of what's happening today is actually all that unusual. They've done it before many, many times. Throw money at the problem. Look at Weimar Republic. Look at Venezuela. It happens in front of your eyes since Bretton Woods all the time. You only have to consider those histor historical events to know that financial assets, therefore, respond and react to these measures, be they fiscal or monetary. This is not the first time this happens. So nobody should be surprised about that. Right. So let me ask you this, though, and actually I want to ask both of you. So you say that um, one shouldn't change systems based on 2020. I agree with that, right? We, we're not uh, in disagreement on that. But I do think you have to take note of it in, 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 in your research, right? Because you could turn around and say in the last three years, we've now seen this three times. We've seen... Relatively quick, I would say, you know, obviously we know February of 18, we had March of 2020, and we had to some extent Q4 of 2018 as well. So this is more frequent than it's happened before to some extent. So my question is just an open-ended question here. It's not an opinion, but my question is, at what point becomes these patterns relevant for how we design our systems. I mean, how many times do we need to see this happen before we might want to rethink the way we do things, right? That, that I think, is relevant to, to ask because we know from the data that trend followers did not do well in those periods. We know that. that that's what the data shows. So how many times do we need to see that happen in front of our eyes before we say, well, hang on. Maybe I do need to look at that and see if I can find a way to deal better with that environment, but without hurting my long-term performance, because that's real improvement. I'm not, I, I, I'm sure this is where you're coming from, Moritz, that we're not trying to make short-term fixes if it hurts our long-term performance. That I think everybody, at least they should understand. That's not what we're trying to do. However, we have to acknowledge that we've had a few incidents in the last three years for whatever reason, that doesn't really matter whether it's politically driven or what, whatever the reason is, that we don't care about. But it shows up in the data and it shows up in our performance. There's no question is that the way we should view this is, is that this is another year that we add to our data set. Is this more important than uh, any other year? Perhaps not. But we also have to realize is that there are certain factors that might affect what may happen in 2021. And the factor would be is, is that, well, you know, we knew that, that some of the, the large dips were arrested because of government policy. So you have to run the scenario in your mind. What happens if those policies don't occur? What, you know, could, could things get worse? Now, interesting when we talk about history is this is that uh, I always go back to one of the great periods for trend followers in the 1990s. Okay? And that was the what Ben Bernanke called the great moderation. Now, in reality, we had the Tacey Bonos crisis. We had the uh, EMS crisis. We had the Asian crisis. So, you know, I think that we've had some great crises during the period of great moderation. And in some senses that 
more, we could be, I could be agreeing with you in a sense is, is that, well, we had a crisis here in March. Is this is that it's one more crisis, one more darn crisis after another. This is the life we lead. And we probably will have it again in 2021. Now, the question comes in is, is, is that how long will it take before it gets adjusted? Or are there outside factors such as government that will impact what the, how that crisis will play out, and does that affect you as a trend follower? And and those are more existential uh, questions. But mm-hmm. this leads to actually, and I, I'm not trying to change the topic, but a piece of research that we, you know, I've been working on with Kaya, the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst Association. We did a survey of hedge fund managers, and we tried to sort of look at different strategies and say, which were the most difficult for investors to make their manager selection, okay? And what, which ones were easier? And it's sort of interesting is, is that there's two areas where it was very difficult, or, or investors said it was very difficult for them to do manager assessment. Number one was venture cap slash private equity. We sort of expected we don't have a lot of information. It's more of an opaque market. The number two area was systematic managers. So surprising about all of the information we have, you trade liquid markets. Uh, and lo and behold, this is that in the top areas, which are the hardest to select for investors, was systematic and CTAs which in some sense is sort of surprising because you sort of said like, well, if you have a model, you could explain the model. You should be able to sort of, we know what the factors are. We know what the markets you trade. It should be relatively easy for us to, to choose uh, one manager over another if you started you know, just uh, uh, initially. And yet this dispersion for 2020 it tells you exactly is that small differences in how people build models could have a big difference in the kind of return you're going to get in one year or in three years or in five years. And uh, just a little bit more on this particular vein is, is, is that the, we asked, okay, well, what are, what are the factors that are most important in manager selection? You know, was it quantitative or qualitative? It's more quantitative for systematic managers relative to, let's say, venture cap. But at the same time, is, is that a high percentage of, the, of trying to determine whether you should select a given manager is based on qualitative factors. And so it goes to the point here for 2020 that small differences in the choices that the manager makes for his model can have large impacts on the type of return you would receive as an investor. And I think that 2020, if you want to say what makes it unique, is is that you may not be able to predict, but you've got to be really careful on the managers you choose because they're not all the same. A trend follower, some people would say, well, a trend follower is a trend follower is a trend follower. And that is not the case. We had, and it, I, I agree with that. I think we can also show, and we've had this actually on the podcast, I think three or four weeks back when I mentioned it, work done by Richard Brennan, just clearly showing that you should, you know, as an allocator, should just pick one CTA, pick a bunch, yep. pick a handful, and you um, diversify that problem to a large extent away. I'd like to remind you that we had massive, absolutely massive, and much greater return dispersion between trend following CTAs in 2008. Some of those managers were up more than 100%. Some of them were up 20%. Now they were all up. So people could say, oh, yeah, I'm happy I'm up. But the dispersion was about 100%, right? Wide. Really, really massive. Much stronger than this year. So this happens all the time. Diversify your bets. And, you know, the other point that you made about, you know, this is, again, the context-related and maybe, like, the um, the outlook. What will the future bring? Where, where are we going? Nobody knows that for sure, of course, you know. But, yes, I mean, you get thinking about some form of a reset, or will that blow up at some point? The governments can print no more. There will be hyperinflation, whatever it is, or reset of the currency system into something else, a jubilee. There's many, many different opinions out there, many different ways forward, and nobody knows which one it's going to be. But 
I'm willing to stick on the trend following path because I think there will be trends going forward and potentially much stronger ones than we had in the past. You know, if they kind of like let it rip at some point, it'll, it'll just go because people become fearful and there will be inflation. And then some will, things may, I'm, I'm not saying that there will, things may just be trending much, much more. I think the context that I think about personally in this, such an environment is to say, okay, even if I'm completely nailing it, I'm, it's all aces. I'm hitting the nail on the head. I have the the most beautifully calibrated trend following system that catches it all. What I will get in return may actually be worthless. It, it might be cash that you put into the back of your F-350 with buckets and it's worth nothing, right? So you've nailed it and your price is zero. You get nothing in return except, you know, beautiful paper color money. So in that context, of course, you say, well, you know, I'm not going to be placing just that one trend following badge. I'll be long some real estate. I'll be long some gold. I'll be long some Bitcoin. I'll be long some other assets that, you know, kind of like keep me out of that craziness. And I completely appreciate that type of thinking. You know, we're, we're not here saying that as soon as you do, as soon as you have any other asset than a trend following type of trading strategy, then that's bad. No, 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 no. I think, you know, it's very important to, you know, have that context in mind and be, at least mindful and thoughtful about you know how things could change and that your trend following system may actually even though it's good not be the winner well i think the one thing i could sort of say it will be a winner is this is it uh, and and when we start to talk about themes for 2021 something i've been talking about is this is is it uh, what is a safe asset generally is is that the, the the view has always been well i got to hold treasuries you know i got to hold government securities because uh, bonds because that's a safe asset because it's negatively correlated with stocks you know i i clip my coupon i get some appreciation in a crisis in a in a in, you know so if there's a flight to safety i got to hold my bonds because you know that's that's going to be my safe asset and when we have rates so low and they're down to zero is is it Maybe the safe asset is the is the asset that uh, that actually trades trends. So in some sense, is that my safe asset for 2021 is a trend following model. Now, albeit is is that the returns have not been strong in, in 2020. But if I sort of said like, where do I think safety will be? I want to be in a place where if I don't have any information about what will be happening in the market, can I have? something that will try to extrapolate the trends that they see, whether it be going short equities, where it be, whether it may be going long or short bonds, where it may be going short to dollar. This is that that could be the safe asset play for 2021. You know, and I'm going to take it a step further, Mark, because that's something if I had if I had more time in the day, I would write this blog post or whatever it is maybe you maybe you should write it mark and we'll talk about it uh, in in a, in a few months on the podcast because there's so much talk about what is a, a good store of value right is it gold is it bitcoin whatever i actually think it's trend following for the exact same reasons that you just said that i, I would truly believe i mean take away the currency risk you still you, you you have that with gold you have that with bitcoin as long as it's dollar denominated so i'm not arguing against that but you're absolutely right in an uncertain world and i think we've proven it this year okay maybe we as an industry didn't make a lot of money but we've been incredibly well behaved overall um relatively low volatility in our returns much better returns compared with most equity markets, uh, except for the US maybe, and so on and so forth. So I actually think that if we could get people to think about trend following as a safe store of value for a big part of, of people's portfolio, as you say, it could be a replacement for the treasury part, which uh, is returnless risk at this point, in my opinion. I think that would be great. And you have to put that in the context, is, is that... Uh I try to look at this as objectively as I can. Is, is that the tremendous play over the last decade was a 60-40 stock bond portfolio. That you know, and let me put it this way: even if you're a trend follower, it was hard to beat the 60-40 stock bond. You could sort of you you figure out what the equity side you want to be. You pick the bond side. That combination was tough to beat, and the reason why is because you had these great unique characteristics of of a negative correlation between stocks and bonds, 
you had the safe asset of bonds that actually had room where the price could appreciate, interest rates could come down, and you were still clipping some coupon. And that was a great combination. The question comes in is on, on going forward is, is that in terms of safety, would you rather hold a 60-40 mix between, let's say, European bonds and European equities over the next year? Or would you rather hold a diversified portfolio that can go long short of assets around the world? And when you pose it that way, I, I think is that trend following could be viewed as a safe asset. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. It, it's... <laughs> Now we have the rebel. He's coming on. I, can, no, I, I don't think the it is rebel a safe here. asset. It is certainly a much safer and a much more intelligent and a way, way better investment strategy than long only bonds or long only equities or even 60 40, right? And even though you could have said in the past 10 years with 60 40 having worked so well, oh, yeah, great. I mean, it has worked so well that back then, but over very long times, I'm 100% positive and convinced that a trend following trading system that can go long and short rather than just hold long positions and actually leverage the bond component up if you do it in a risk parity style which you know a lot of people do as well is a much safer and a, and a way better investment strategy for long investment horizons but it's not an asset it is a, it is a strategy right, right? It, it operates with fiat assets. And I, I absolutely don't think it is a storehold of wealth, as Niels was saying. I, I completely disagree with that. It is everything. But it, it, you know, unless you denominate your fund in gold, which some have done, which I think is a great idea. So a gold denominated CTA or a Bitcoin denominated CTA. Now we're talking about actually something that can be a storehold of wealth. But anything that pays out fiat is, I mean, look at all the zeros around the world. That is not a storehold of wealth. A bond is probably the worst, but cash is trash, right? So if it pays out cash, it is definitely not a storehold of wealth. And it never has been. None of these currencies, except the US dollar and the pound, have survived. And the, the pound and the dollar are massively down. People just don't realize that fact. And, you know, you could actually say it is to a certain extent true for gold, which has the longest track record of being used as a monetary metal, a monetary asset, and a storehold of wealth for centuries, right? But it does inflate by about 2 to 3% a year. And the higher the gold price, uh, the more the mines actually put an effort into mining more gold. So at 2%, mathematically, after 38 years, if you compound it for 38 years, 2%, you're 100% inflation. You've lost your money in gold, right? And 38 years is within our lifetime, by the way. This is not something that, you know, is spread out over something that you don't get to see. That happens while you are on planet Earth. So, no, it's not a storehold of wealth. It is a trading strategy that, you know, for most part pays out fiat money. Then you need to do something else with that fiat money. But, yeah, is it, is it better than 60-40? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think I'm taking poetic license with uh, a strategy versus a safe asset. But I think that uh, the reason why... You know, I still like that story is that it embodies many of the things we want in an uncertain world. In an uncertain world, we don't know what's going to happen. So, so we have to put more value on what is the price, what our price is telling us in our behavior. In an uncertain world, we also want to be able to go long and short. So we want to have strategies that could be able to sort of say that I'm agnostic on whether I should be long or short any given market. Mm -hmm. And I think that the other advantage is, is that I also want to be agnostic and what is the asset class I choose. I want to try to find opportunities wherever they may be. And I think it, uh, the one thing that I follow is, is that there's a number of uncertainty indices that have been developed. And what they do is they take news stories and then they'll, they'll, they'll generate sort of what would they consider the amount of uncertainty by keyword searches. So it's mostly done out of Stanford universities and is readily available is that the, the level of uncertainty that we've seen over the last few years, it, it peaked in April and it's, it's come down, but the numbers and the global and the U.S. uncertainty, policy uncertainty, have been extremely high. And so it's hard for anyone to forecast what direction we're going to do. So in an uncertain world, this is that there's a premium on being able to be nimble in where you're going to put your money. 
and that and that may not be in gold because gold I think sometimes re- reflects people's views at any given point in time. It's it, it's almost a reflection of of, of uh, you know sometimes it, it's correlated with gold uh, with inflation. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it represents uncertainty. Sometimes it doesn't. So I think we want to have a, a, a strategy that will be able to protect money in any kind of environment. And that's a long, short strategy. And the, and the deciding factor is what are the trends? Yeah, I mean, obviously, in, in a sense, I'm not completely surprised that more to disagree on the, on, on the store of, of wealth and, and all of that stuff, because I imagine that when you talk to people nowadays and they talk about fiat and all of that stuff, it all leads back to, well, then there's only one and that's Bitcoin. And I just don't agree with that. You know, you can't have something that is so volatile as your store of value. I mean, when it goes down 80% in, in a few months, that's crazy in my opinion. So uh, it, it may over time develop to something stable and, and free from fiat, although it's still denominated in US dollars to some extent. If you want your cash, you need to convert it to something. And if the dollar is worth nothing i mean i don't know how much that helps uh, with your bitcoin so um so i don't know i'm i'm more in on mark's camp that something that is more stable and and able to be long and short and i know it's not a single assets it's a strategy comprised of obviously many assets but we talk about it as one asset class or or, or, or and so on and so forth and for me i think it certainly represents something that is fairly stable and that I don't think will suddenly go down 80% in value. It's, it's not that. I mean, I'm not holding up the, the Bitcoin flag here, as you know, not, not only. Then use gold. Gold is substantially less volatile, but uh, it has kept its value much, much better than fiat cash. So there are some people saying that, you know, over time, Bitcoin will become substantially less volatile. I don't know that. I don't have an opinion about that. Right now, it is crazily volatile, so you can really only manage it by position sizing appropriately. But for sure, we do know that you know paper money is not a good storehold of wealth. And you know this is, I mean, open any textbook on financial history, and it, it's right there. It's it's a fact. It's it's undeniable fact. So you have to think about what you're going to do with that money, and um, your trend following trading system may protect it and may be a very safe strategy in that fiat space but then you have to do something with it after the fact yeah but don't you have to do that at some point i mean with gold you can have 20 years where it i mean it has fallen there's been periods where gold prices have gone down for 20 years sure because other things have gone up but you're talking about a storehold of wealth right i mean some people they use stocks now as a storehold of wealth you know, there's, and, and this has happened before, by the way, you know, rather than putting your money into a bond where, you know, if inflation comes and you're holding a long duration bond, then you're really, really hurting, right? For sure. And rather than, you know, some people cannot afford property anymore, it's, you know, very expensive. So, yeah, but put it by, buy a piece of a company, buy a piece of a stock and be a Tesla, right? Uh, valuations no longer matter, but at least you get access still in the fiat world, but at least you get access to some real business, some real assets behind that company. That's also a store of wealth, and some of that is also crazily volatile. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, we're coming to to the end of our conversation today, so I don't want to keep people too long on this point, but still, for, for me at least, and I don't mean this might be different for you, because I actually don't disagree with the fact that equities could be a new safe haven compared to many other things. I don't disagree with that point, but I find it a little bit difficult to understand if you really want to store your wealth, would you ever choose something that could have that level of volatility? I don't think that's sensible, really. And that's why it disqualifies some of these single asset classes like equities and stuff like that. And I actually think that a diversified trend-following portfolio may not make as much money as a single stock i you know but it we've certainly kept up over time with equity indices as a whole at least we have at done for 47 years mm. and it's been a lot, lot more stable than well let, let some of these single assets right let's just make that final point everything that has zero volatility or the stability that you seek Niels, is a guaranteed destruction of wealth cash goes to zero over long times it has no volatility but 
it destroys your wealth. I didn't say we didn't have some volatility because clearly trend following has had plenty no, no, of volatility. Cash, it's cash. just not 80% yeah. volatility. Everything that is not volatility, right? And the other one is now bonds have very little volatility, but they have a lot of risk and, and no return. And if inflation comes, they're really looking real bad. So anything that is a real storehold of wealth will have volatility. Yes. No, agree. I just don't think that the amount of volatility you get from a Tesla or from a Bitcoin or even from gold is the kind of volatility you would put all your money in. At least I don't see many investors put, except for a few people who I know on Real Vision have been very vocal about putting 98% of their free cash into Bitcoin. And and I think that's a bold move, of course, but, but I don't see many of people with that kind of courage to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that this is... Uh the point, the important point is, is, is that government policies have had an insidious effect on safe assets. There are, uh, it is hard to find a safe asset when, uh, let's say, when uh, because of the uh, increases in, in the size of fiat money, is that the, the value has been destroyed. It's, uh, and so then you say, well, I have to then cho choose something else. Is gold? Well, that's that's better, but it still has volatility. You, you know, what we're Sarah saying is, you dri uh, drove rates down to negative levels. Well, then people sort of said, well, maybe the safe asset is a dividend-paying stock. Maybe it's a uh, an, uh, it's a tech play. So what happens is that because we've destroyed the concept of a safe asset, we have forced people to make different decisions across the spectrum of assets to. to form what they think is safe. And I think that in that kind of world, the only thing you can do is follow a strategy that sort of tries to be nimble. And then you say, well, what does it mean to be nimble? Well, in, in, uh, from our view, and I think I'm preaching to, with both of you, is that the way to be nimble is to follow the price action and follow trends. Yes. And nimbleness will create safety. And, and I think that that's the that's the point we want to try to get for 2021 is, is, is that, that, that given we don't know what will happen, you need to be nimble. And we know that with all the forecasts that we're going to see in, at the end of this year from all the major banks and all the uh, brokerage firms, we know that most of them are going to be stale within 30 days. So the only thing we could sort of say is, is that I will not make a prediction per se of what will happen in 21. My prediction is that markets will move, investors need to be nimble, and the best way to be nimble is to pro follow the price action and trends. Amen. I think we can all agree to that. For sure. Now, um, we've taken a lot of your time, Mark, on a Friday afternoon, your time, Friday evening, our time. So um, I will save the next points for next time we, uh, we hear from you, which is hopefully not that long from now. In the meantime... Before we wrap up completely, in terms of performance, actually, as 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 uh, we have indicated early on, um, performance is looking better as we come to the close of the year. The beta 50 index is up another one and a half percent so far in December, up 2.4 percent year to date. The Sokjian CTA index up also 1.6 percent, down about three quarters of a percent for the year. The Sokjian trend index up 2.2 percent, up almost two percent for the year. Uh, catching up on the short-term traders index, which is up a quarter percent, up two and a half percent for the year. MSCI still doing well, up another 1.76 percent as of yesterday, Thursday. It's actually losing money today, so it might be getting more flattish for December. And and uh, world government bonds having a good day today and up a little bit so far this month. Next week, by the way, we will have Jerry Parker back. So keep your questions coming in for Jerry. You can email them to info at toptradersonplug.com and we'll do our best to get them answered next week. Before we finish, Mark, uh, Mort and I sometimes share some of the good content that we've come across. It could be a podcast, could be a white paper, whatever it is. Besides your own good stuff that you produce so much of um, and people should, really should go and check it out, are there anything that have sort of caught your attention in the last week, two weeks that you thought was really well put together? Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll sort of say that uh, I wrote a b blog post, of, uh, it was probably about a month and a half ago, and said that every investment committee should have a devil's advocate, that you need someone to sort of take an opposite position because that leads to better decision making. 
And even if you're building a model, you want to have someone to be a devil's advocate to say, well, what if we try something else as opposed to get the consensus? One of my readers sent back and said, you got to read this book. It's called In Defense of Troublemakers. And what they said is, is that that actually is, is that that having faux devil's advocates or actors who sort of pretend to be taking the opposite view leads to worse decision making because it just causes the majority to come up with uh, stronger opinions. But that you, when you think of diversity in your company, when you think of diversity in your business, it's diversity of opinion. And that, you, and that even if those opinions are wrong, it causes the majority to, to think harder and make better decisions in the long run, even if they don't change their mind. But the, the process of their decisions will be better. So I would sort of say that that's the most important piece that I've read in the last month. And it sort of caused me to just, I, I just posted a new post to say I was wrong about the devil's advocate. You don't need one. You just need good dissent. And I think that that occurs when we have these discussions. This is that we want dissent because then I think your uh, your listeners become better informed because they have different points of view. Completely agree. And they will start thinking about it from different angles, right? I, I completely agree with that. I think, you know, personally, it's very helpful to me to be challenged. Have somebody that respectfully takes another side, maybe diametrically different and comes from a completely different angle. So for instance, you know, to, to preemptively answer your question, Niels, about a good podcast, you know, a lot of people speak about inflation these days. And we have mentioned the inflation word a couple of times today. You don't see much inflation in the CPI basket. You see massive asset price inflation. So now let's hear somebody who comes at that from the other side. There is a podcast on the Investors Podcast Network speaking about the deflationary world. So the opposite of inflation, saying, look, I mean, no matter how much money they throw at the problem, we have a poor demographics, people getting older, right? Uh, we have technology that's eating the world, that's killing prices. We are in a deflationary world. So go away with all your inflation talk. And then you start thinking about that and your view on inflation may change or at least get challenged and you take on a different perspective and you find some middle ground or discover some perspective or points that you have disregarded before. And that can only be beneficial. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, and and people who listen to this podcast, they know that it's not always that uh, Moritz and I agree. So uh, that is exactly why we have these conversations. We we learn from, from it. And by the way, the book is, I think, from Charlene Jean Nemeth, the book In Defense of Troublemakers. So if you want to go and check that out, you can do so. Mark, this has been so much fun and interesting as as always so we want to have you back soon in the meantime though i will wrap up here and say from mark moritz and me thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you next week with jerry as i said get your questions in by email and in the meantime be well and stay safe Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.